Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. It was great seeing so many of you in L.A. last week for Freeze L.A. and Felix. It's just incredible how much the art ecosystem in Los Angeles has really grown over the last several years. You have the fairs, which have expanded themselves over the years. You have so many galleries out there now. The museums are very good, and there is an abundance of artists living in L.A. Some have been there for a long time. Others are flocking there to enjoy the nice weather in larger studios compared to New York. The only negative, really, is how long it takes to get around town. I always arrive with a lengthy itinerary, and unfortunately, I never make my way all the way through it because of the traffic and just how spread out the city is. But if you haven't been to LA in a while, I definitely recommend it, especially during the fair week with so much going on. In this week's episode of the podcast, we're joined by Benjamin Sutton, editor for the Americas at the Art Newspaper to help us recap last week's fairs in L.A. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks so much for listening. Ben, thanks so much for chatting with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me back, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here. One big story of the week was the change in venues this year for Freeze LA, moving to the Santa Monica Airport. I know it. Uh, the locals in LA had a lot of thoughts about it, as well as uh, people <laughs> traveling uh, in from out of town. What, yeah. Why uh, did Freeze move locations? If you can remind us why they did that, and what was the consensus response to the change in scenery? Oh, yeah. Loaded question. Um I mean, I, I, I don't know if we can say exactly for sure why they moved locations. I think part of it is just that uh, Freeze has ambitions of making their L.A. fair bigger and their previous locations, uh, the Beverly Hills Hilton last year and then Paramount Studios um, the two prior years just had a, a sort of a constrained footprint. You know, there, there wasn't that much real estate they could work with. And um, you really saw that impacting, especially last year, the kind of breadth of programming they could have. And I think by virtue of moving to the Santa Monica airport this year, you know, um, the fair was a quarter bigger than it had been last year. So even just in terms of the sheer number of galleries that they could have, um, you know, it, it really sort of allowed them to um, expand their footprint. Um, and, you know, something that started out in 2019 as a, you know, a 70 gallery fair, sort of like a, a boutique offering has really started to take on a kind of uh, mega fair scale. Um, in terms of the venue itself, I mean, uh, you know, I think last year they had had to pare down quite a bit of their offering um, because of the space and because of, you know, supply chain issues and um, shipping reasons. They had to cancel their public art program at the last minute. And this year they kind of brought back a lot of the the sort of features that had made the original Freeze LA at Paramount Studios um, you know, fairly unique uh, in the fair, in the global fair landscape. Um, you know, they got to sort of rekindle some of the, the weirdness and funkiness of the, the original venue. Um, Santa Monica Airport is is kind of a weird place. Um, and they could sort of replicate um, some of the like outdoor restaurants and bars that they used to stage at Paramount Studios in the, um, the sort of New York City streetscape back lot, which was so much fun. Um, here it sort of happened on the tarmac or it happened outside a hangar, uh, you know, there was a VIP breakfast at the Museum of Flying, which is the sort of like funny little um, uh, like airport museum at Santa Monica Airport. Uh, there was a project involving um, the street team from the Los Angeles football club because uh, there are football court or soccer courts there. Um, and, and yeah, and this artist Basil Kincaid did this great project wrapping an airplane in a quilt. So there were all these ways in which they could sort of make more use of the space and and the venue and the, it's sort of like unusual kind of quirkiness which really wasn't there last year you know a, a hotel no no matter how nice uh, is still just a hotel um so i think that was sort of like the positive side i guess um i think for a lot of people it was a kind of challenging site to get to the kind of layout and configuration of it was kind of complicated um you know they were the 
for those who didn't attend, the fair was essentially split between two locations, one of which is this um, historic airplane hangar, the Barker hangar. Um, Santa Monica Airport, turns out, is like one of the oldest airports in the country. It's It turns 100 uh, in April. Um, so the smaller part of the portion of the fair, um, including the focus sector for younger galleries and the galleries showing kind of more modern, quote unquote, historic works was in the Barker Hangar. And then the bulk of the galleries in the sort of main gallery sector were in um, sort of, you know, the, the trademark freeze tents, uh, which had been erected on the um, east side of the, the canvas. And then there were kind of the fleets of golf carts going back and forth in between. Um, and I think, you know, that configuration was a little confusing. And we heard uh, both myself and my my colleague, um, Carly Porterfield, who, who was reporting on the fair for us, um, you know, heard from a number of galleries in the Barker hangar space that, you know, they were, they hadn't quite realized how far apart the venues were going to be. And they were a little worried about sort of, you know, the impact on foot traffic, because it did feel as though the, the Barker hangar site was kind of the the secondary site, or, you know, you could, you could kind of miss it if you didn't know it was there. So I think there's some, you know, if, if Breeze chooses to return to Santa Monica airport next year, um, there's definitely some kind of logistical and layout questions that they're going to have to, to figure out. Um, But yeah, I mean, on on the whole, I think it, it was successful considering all those, um, all those limitations Um, and certainly, you know, shifting the focus of the week, westward to kind of santa monica and venice was an interesting an interesting approach you know the the past freeze la weeks have been very much sort of like beverly hills and hollywood and and downtown focused and so um bringing some attention to the west side of the city was i I think refreshing for some people and, and probably just um a lot of time spent in ubers for other people yeah, I mean, LA felt spread out and big already, and now with Freeze all the way on the west side in Santa Monica, the art landscape becomes even wider in LA. I thought it felt like a typical Freeze environment after you made your way to Santa Monica and actually were in the tent at the fair. I do agree with what you said about that second or additional, almost supplemental area for the remaining galleries. I mean, after walking through the fair for three, four, five, six hours, I think the appetite is pretty low for visitors to want to stop by the other tent to do it all over again, as opposed to maybe heading back to the more central part of LA and resuming your life. Maybe they'll figure out a way to resolve that for future editions. Maybe shuttles will go back and forth, like those carts you see in the airport or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in a weird way, it's sort of a an appropriate uh, kind of throwback to the way Freeze London is configured, right? Because you've got yes. the main fair at one side of Regent's Park and Freeze Masters at the other side. And it's in that context, it's kind of a pleasant walk through the park for about 15 minutes to get to the other tent. But something about maybe it's just the first time or something about this didn't quite click, I don't think, at Freeze LA. But we'll see, you know, I'm sure if if... If they stick with the same venue next year, I'm sure that this is going to be one of the the issues they'll try to resolve. Yeah, and so if we look at the art on view and the sales that happened um, from your reporting, what were a few of the headline sales from this year's edition of the fair? Sure. I mean, I was sort of looking back at last year's sales and um, just kind of like sizing up how they measure against this year's. And it's pretty remarkable, I think, that we're not remarkable. It's notable that this year's sort of top level sales are pretty consistent with last year's. Yeah, you're sort of seeing works in the in a low seven figures. So the I think the biggest sale probably of the week was um, Hauser and Worth, which had devoted mm-hmm. uh, its booth almost entirely to to LA based artists. Um, sold a, a new Mark Bradford canvas for um, three point five million. Um, as far as I know, that was the biggest sale of the week. Uh, but there were several other kind of like very high level um, sales. So David Swerner sold a, a Dana Schutz painting for, for 1.2 million. Um, uh, Thaddeus Ropak, which seems to be perpetually selling a massive George Bosolitz uh, paintings, sold one actually appropriately titled in Hollywood, um, one of his you know huge upside down figure paintings for 1.3 million euros. Um, <clears throat> Pace was a little vague and didn't specify what they had sold for 2 million, but they're their biggest price sale of the week was uh, a two million dollar work, um, possibly the uh, the Agnes Martin that they had on their stand. Um, uh, the sort of craze for Ernie Barnes continued. Ortizar Projects and Andrew Kreps, two uh, New York based galleries, had a solo booth 
devoted to Ernie Barnes, the you know professional football player turned painter um, whose sugar shack sort of stunned everyone uh, at at auction last year. Um, they sold upwards of $3 million worth of Barnes works just on the first day of the fair, uh, including one painting for, for over a million. Um, so there really was quite a lot at that sort of that higher end of the, of the sales. Um, you know, there, there are a few more in that seven, seven figure range. Um, but, but what I thought was sort of equally heartening was to see that a lot of local galleries, you know, were really keeping pace and doing really well. It wasn't just the sort of big, big global forces or the kind of um, the New York galleries that had parachuted in. It's, it's also like, you know, David Kordansky had probably one of the most um, hard to miss booths, like right by the, the main entrance to the fair. And it was a solo stand of Chase Hall paintings. And those all sold out um, in during the, the first day, the, the preview. Um, and a, a few of the galleries that were showing in the Barker hangar section um, for, for younger galleries, the focus section, you know, reported sold out booths, including Make Room, which is one of the LA galleries that just expanded with a new space in Hollywood. Um, Chris Sharp Gallery had a had an excellent solo booth of works by Edgar Martin uh, Ramirez, uh, and uh, I think almost all those works sold on the VIP day. One of them was actually acquired by the City of Santa Monica, um, and at Egby had a great uh, solo booth of Jane Margaret uh, ceramic works, which also sold out. So um, it was. It was notable to me that, you know, the the fair could not not only sustain that kind of high level seven figure sale by the kind of global powerhouses that you expect to be making those sales, but that also, you know, the the smaller galleries in the focus sector in the kind of harder to reach or maybe off the radar Parker Hanger venue um, and showing local artists, uh, you know, really were doing well as well. And I think that that kind of test is a testament to, to how successful the, the fair was. Yeah, and I mean, you touched on this a bit, but really, when you think about it, this was really the first, maybe the first big test in a way for the contemporary art market in this calendar year. Yeah. Um, I know in the broader economy, there's been a, a lot of economic uncertainty, talks of recession. So I do think people are very, even from my conversations, for people who didn't come to the fair, they asked, you know, what was the mood like? How were sales overall? What was the sentiment? Trying to understand, you know, if things are still strong or if there's maybe some softening. What was your impression about the sales overall and what the sentiment was at the fair? It's a good question. I, to me, honestly, it felt like we had sort of uh, rebounded already to kind of where we were last year at this time. You know, I, I think in the fall and winter, like at, at Freeze London and our Basel Miami Beach, there was this def- there was definitely this sense of like, you know, not knowing exactly what was in store and, you know, very real fears of a recession and people sort of wanting to play it safe and wanting to sort of um, move cautiously. And I didn't really sense that much last week. Uh, to me, it felt like we had sort of returned to last year's mood, which was kind of this buoyant moment where we were coming out of the pandemic and there was all this pent up demand and pent up savings that collectors were looking to spend. And, um, you know, to me, it really felt like, uh, yeah, there was a sense that the the kind of like worst fears of a recession had maybe eased a little bit and people were kind of ready to get to get back to it. Um, but that was, you know, that's just the sense I got. I mean, it, it's certainly not as if, um, you know, those those macroeconomic factors are not hitting Southern California. I mean, you know, like a, a week before the fair opened, Disney laid off 7000 people. So um, it's not as if you know, that wasn't uh, at play, but uh, to me, it really felt like, um, like the market had sort of turned a corner or had um, kind of thrown off these concerns that even, you know, two months ago in Miami were, were much more present. If we think about LA and how much it's changed over the years, I mean, there's so many events throughout the week. I always get excited and try to plan my itinerary and be efficient with, my time by planning Mm -hmm. things out, you know, based on our location. And then of course, you know, you run out of time and you have you, after a couple of days, you are resigned to the fact that you will only, you won't be able to experience everything you wanted to, but, but there's just so much going on there. It's for those who haven't been in a few years, just how much has LA and the art ecosystem really evolved in the last few years? 
and, you know, people in LA say this a lot, but like the bedrock of that ecosystem has been, has been there for years. And you've got like, you know, this sort of um, constellation of very influential art schools like CalArts and Otis and the Roski School at, at USC. Um, you know, obviously the huge museums, MoCA, the Getty, LACMA, the Broad, um, and the Hammer, et cetera. And then this sort of like, historically smaller contingent of of kind of really important galleries like your Bum and Pose, David Kordansky's Regan Projects, et cetera. And I feel like what Freeze has really sort of managed to do over these five years now um, is to really kind of mm, not just like capture, but boost that community um, and really sort of like create a setting where not only can those galleries thrive, but like this younger community of galleries can really start to do ambitious things and, and find find their way. And obviously the city benefits, you know, at least compared to New York or London from uh, relative availability of, um, you know, commercial real estate. So you, you see, you know, relatively young galleries doing really ambitious large scale projects. Um, you know, I'm thinking of galleries like Night Gallery and Luis de Jesus and, and at IB and, François Gabali. I mean, there's this sort of like cohort of of kind of you almost want to call them second generation LA galleries that have carved out such a big um, sort of influence for themselves, um, kind of in parallel to the rise of Freeze LA itself. Um, and I think you know that has engendered this like larger community of collectors as well um, that have been nurtured by these these galleries and now. I don't, there's just this sense of, um, I, I don't know if you felt this, but I, this week or last week in particular, it just, it felt like everything was sort of clicking and the influx of larger galleries from New York and Europe, um, you know, Hauser and Worth just opened another space in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean Kelly and Chardon's Daughters from New York have recently launched spaces there. You've got Perotin, Listen, Zwerner, all, you know, sort of, plotting spaces in the coming months. Um, you know, it's almost like impossible to list all the galleries that are moving in or local galleries that are expanding. Um, and I feel like that has really been aided to some extent by by the spotlight that Freeze shines on the LA art market, you know, at least once a year. Yeah, I think when I go, for, it feels like Freeze is just one activity in the week on their itinerary. We have the fair, you have all the galleries, all the museums, and so many artists are based in LA now. So yeah, I think that speaks a lot to how much the art community and world there has grown. And um, yeah, I'm curious to see what it looks like and how it continues to uh, evolve over the next few years. Yeah. So before we let you go, I want to ask you, you know, there were so many market insiders congregating <laughs> together at the fair, um, yeah. as does happen. I was wondering from speaking to uh, a lot of them, if were there a few recurring topics maybe they were discussing throughout the week um, or things that were just on people's minds that um, you were communicating with? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as we sort of just touched on just the sheer number of the things happening and specifically of gallery openings. Um, I mean, the number of galleries that inaugurated new spaces or pop-ups last week was kind of mind boggling. And I think um, that was very much, uh on people's mind just i mean as you were saying the kind of um the impossibly stacked calendar of events um but specifically kind of gallery openings uh i think really impressed a lot of the folks who were coming in from out of town um and and sort of reinforcing that sense of this la market moment really kind of reaching a new level um you know there was certainly a lot of griping about how confusing the layout of freeze was um, also heard quite a few people complain that uh, the VIP opening at Felix, which was moved up a day so as not to conflict with the VIP opening of Breeze, uh, was so sort of so crowded that nobody could actually do or see anything or have any conversations. Um, uh, I mean, you know, the other, I guess the other kind of uh, silver lining of, of a crowded fair in LA is um, celebrity spotting. There was certainly a lot of chatter about kind of starstruck gallerists um you know watching Gwyneth Paltrow walk by or John McEnroe stopping by the booth um you know even the most jaded art world person can can still get starstruck so that's that's always nice to hear um 
honestly, the, the thing that sort of most struck me in talking to people last week was to what extent um, auction houses were kind of were on their radar. In in my experience, I mean, I, I missed the first Freeze LA, but I think I've been to everyone since. Auction houses have always kind of been a sort of like peripheral or like tertiary presence. It's really been about like the galleries and the museums and, you know, like you said, like artists and artist studios. Um, but this year, you know, you had Philips uh, launching uh, a non um, a selling exhibition with Artadia, the, non-pro- the art nonprofit. Um, Christie's doing an exhibition uh, surrounding Desert X, the um, the public art biennial in the Coachella Valley, and um, and Bonham's held like a full scale seventy one lot contemporary art sale on Friday, um, and to me like that, the kind of attention for those events and the um, and just the fact that they were happening really sort of signaled uh, a kind of uh, like a moving up in weight class for Freeze Week LA. Like I think to me that sort of like puts it on puts it towards equal footing with you know the comparable freeze weeks in uh in new york and london which are always tied or timed to the big um the big sales in those cities in october the big auction sales in october and may um and to to have that kind of level of attention and level of coordination um among the auction houses seemed like you know something pretty new and signs of bigger things to come. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Well, Ben, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast and helping us recap this year's edition of Freeze LA and all the other happenings occurring throughout the city. If our listeners don't already, they should definitely check out uh, everything you write at the Art Newspaper and all the coverage you do there. And you're also on social media, often uh, reporting and talking about the art market. Where can we find you there? Uh, yeah, the best places are uh, B H Sutton uh, on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, my confusing handle is it's Ben Sutton. Perfect, Ben. Thanks so much again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for having me, and uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure. <laughs>